wanted to ask you uh, your opinion. You point out that the Confessions and Chemnitz, and, and in fact the whole Lutheran theological tradition, uh, take these texts, specifically the John 20 text and the Matthew 28 text, to refer to the ministry of, of the Word. And you point out uh, what, what you say there in the treatise that the uh, call the, the, the pastor is a, it is a proceeds from the general call of, of the apostles. Uh, and uh, Panicky, that old Wisconsin Synod guy, said that the that the uh, ordinary preaching office is the is the continuation of the extraordinary apostolic office. So this tradition of ours seems to have been stopped. I, I hate to blame the brief statement, but the brief statement does use these texts to refer to the to all Christians. Now the way I dealt with this, as I say, yeah, that's true too. Uh, but, uh, but in the first instance, Christ is establishing the public ministry of the Word. How do you think we should deal with that? Because the brief statement is part of our more recent tradition. And how do we kind of resurrect these passages in teaching <coughs> people back to the use that you point out in, in your paper? How do you deal with with this claim that, well, it's given to all Christians, so it isn't the institution of the God. Yeah, I think first thing, Rolf, is look at the hard data. That's the first thing we have to do. What does the hard data say? And then go from there. That's the very most important thing to do in having our discussion again. Okay? So then you have to trace how all of this is used, and I tried to do a little bit of that here. And I, I'm not aware. See, I don't even read the brief statement. I, I, I didn't even, wasn't even aware of that. That's new to me. So now I've got to think on the top of my feet. Um, and I don't do that very well sometimes, so you have to have mercy on me. Uh, so the hard data, but then, then, okay, so you've revealed something to me that I wasn't aware of. So how do we deal with that? Okay, hard data. Now we've got something, uh, Luther did it too, like the John 20 text. I am aware of this. You read Luther in John 20, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, he will extol both. The institution, the office, and it, when, in, when in need, go to your brother for absolution, or to hear the word of the gospel. So he'll do both. And, and he, he does the, the balancing act, for lack of better terminology, because he doesn't get rid of the office, he keeps the office, and still extols the vocation of the Christian as father, mother, etc. So when Luther does both with the and institution passages, he keeps the office, and in no way then, when all Christians can do these things, like forgive and speak the gospel, it does not uh, intrude into that divine office. They're still in their vocation as father, mother, etc. I think maybe our problem is, is first we deny there is an office. You know, everybody can do it. There really is no office. There's just functions to do. Um, the other thing too is, I think this has helped some lay people who run with this. They'll say, well, we don't need you, Reverend. We can all do it. Or no, no, no. What I wanted to say was this, is before I'll extol what I did here today about God and Christ being in the, in the, in the office doing the things that he's given, I'll st I won't start there. I'll start with the holy and royal priesthood. And I'll talk about mother, father, and go through vocation and show these folks that God is at work through you. So how does God create this little baby? Did he do this? Nope. He used a mom and a dad. You. So God was actually using you. You were his instruments to not only create this life, but also to sustain it. So God is actively present in his creatures, taking care of creation. And then when I go to the ministry, no problems all of a sudden. So maybe there's a thing that we need to do better, huh? What do you think? Thank you for uh, my brief statement now. So that's good. I, now, let me ask you a question. Does the brief statement use those texts in, in extolling the institution of the office? They, they talk about the needs of grace. That's under the needs of grace and given to all Christians. There's a little bit, yeah, kind of moving in this direction. So it's not like this everyone a minister business just boom happened. Uh, it, took a, it took a generation of preparation. And uh, so. Yeah, I agree with you. I, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for this. One is the, the biblical ignorance and the confessional ignorance that, that goes into the Missouri Senate. I know you're, you're, you're shocked that I would say, no, don't be. But you see, 
think about this. When you switch from German to English, you're a German church, and you have men who go to the seminary who can no longer speak and read German or Latin. They can't read the confessions. They can't read much of Luther because most of it hasn't been translated yet. And so you have this theological gap that's been going, that had been going on in the Missouri Synod for generations, I would contend, on this particular topic. And thus there's an ignorance, if you will. Maybe not necessarily, um, what's the right word, a vehement uh, trying to teach false doctrine, but just an ignorance. You know? And I think part of the, the joy of living in the time in which we live, you know, with things being translated, plus men now are learning German and Latin and can actually read the stuff now. And, and so we're rejoicing in the heritage that we've got. So let's put it this way. Let's fall in love with the Reformation all over again, shall we? You know, on this topic. You know? And so we can rejoice in both, can't we? Question. Thank you for your keen, keen insights. I really appreciate them. But probably one of the most difficult jobs we have in the ministry is, is being good stewards of the keys, being good stewards of the mysteries, and you know, making use of binding keys probably one of the most painful things we have to do. In your example, I was kind of you know wondering at what point you stay true to your vows and not live it. And is there a point when conflict of interest comes into play and you remove yourself from something? I couldn't see myself in the picture you drew having to use the binding key on my own life. I, I couldn't even put myself there. So I guess I'm trying to understand, do you see, and my question is... If your wife was the adulteress? <laughs> no. <laughs> it, my question really has to do with conflict of interest. Do you ever see a conflict of interest being something that a... A shepherd says, you know what, I, I need to, or she dog, or pup better, I need, to, I need to have another brother come in and handle this because I just can't do it. Maybe. Maybe. That could be. And, and hypothetically, I can't think of an example right now, but that could very well be the case. Yeah. But we'd have to take each case by case. Uh, yeah, we'd have to talk about, I haven't really given that much thought. You know, let me piggyback on some of this, this talking. You know, it's like, like sometimes, you know, we're using the keys, both loosing and binding. It's like you pull the trigger on the binding key, and it's, it's usually, this is my way of thinking on this, and I've actually done this, is you, 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 you're very patient, you're very kind, and you ask diagnostic questions. Uh, for example, do you believe that this is God-pleasing? And if the answer is, I don't give a rip. Really? <laughs> really? I'm, I'm shocked by that. You're a baptized Christian, and, and you don't, you don't, you're not concerned if this is God pleasing. Nope. Nope. Well, I want, I want to tell you something. What you're doing is not God pleasing. This is a sin. This is against his word and his will. I want to tell you that. Now, you just chew on that for a while. And, you know, it's like, it's like letting a cocklebur be in, in their crotch. Let, let them chew on that for a while. or let, let their crotch chew on it. And then you just over time, you just try and diagnostically, you say, now, okay, what, we talked about this before. Now, where are you at? Where are you at? I've shown you from Scripture. Let's look at it again. Now where are you at? I don't give a rip. And you're kind of like, you know, the pastor's got to, you know, this, this is what I learned from older pastors. Thanks be to God. Because I was a young, you know, and they'd settle down, Brent. So they'd say, Brent, just deal with people in this way by saying, like a father would deal with his child. Like, we need to sit down and have a serious conversation here. And so, you know, finally, if, if it comes to the point sometimes, not always, but sometimes it the person will say, and this happened to me in my first congregation. This is what happened. The man said in his living room, and an elder was present. He said, Pastor, don't come here to my house ever again. And I said, are you sure? Yes, I am sure. So you don't want me to speak God's word to you anymore. He said, that's right. Don't come back here. I'm not going to let you in. I will not hear God's word from you anymore. I said, fine, then you won't get it. And I used the key on him. And you know how that went. And thus the language in my paper. Because the old Adam was attacked. The idolatrous God within her was attacked. I, I, I just, I'm just, you know, you're just shocked. Really? You've got to be kidding me. Is that really what you want? See, I think, I think pastorally, I think that's, that's where you get to the clincher. Is that what you really want? And if they say, yeah, that's what I want, then God's going to give it to you. Or to put it this way, you know, you're going to end up where you're going if you keep going the way you're going. I'm here to tell you that, you know. Don't say it like Coolman. <laughs> Question. Uh, yeah, in your conclusion, you, you talk uh, in one paragraph about the 
this food resolution process in the next paragraph's first sentence. It starts the odd man out, however, in, the, in this entire process. Okay, here we are. I would like, I mean, since we're spending this day discussing, uh, that would be on page nine. I just refer to that because I think to make this uh, day uh, constructive and to really look at things in an honest way, um, I'd love to know if you could give us more specific examples of how you think um, the dispute resolution process, uh, I'm not here to argue if it's totally right or totally wrong, but just how you see how this um, leads to Jesus being the odd man out. I think that's what we have to get at. If that's what we're about, Jesus, and you know, that's that's why I like to hear more about what do you honestly think. Well, I don't. I do not know the details. I'm not a handbook guy, so I do not know the details of how this process process works. I'm an outsider looking in, and I just simply have a general concern, the general theological concern, and and it's as I said in my paper. And it could be that, the, the DRP, it could be in just a congregational meeting, it could be in any kind of conversation. When you exclude Jesus from sinners, watch out. Question. Thank you for your paper. In the opening paragraphs, you described the uh, case regarding uh, Dr. Kenneth Corbett, in which he uh, found the woman and then released her later on in life when she came to him. And uh, when he had forgiven her and said that she was free to come to the sacrament, she said voluntarily, but I would like you to announce That's that correct. to the congregation. Is the pastor under any sort of an obligation in the case of a, an open sin, such as this woman was committing in the sense of public knowledge? And the la you're talking about the latter part when she was absolved and admitted to communion? Well, when, when she was committing the sin, this was well known, I presume. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's public. Yes. And so she has confessed to him privately. Is the pastor under some obligation to announce this to the congregation? To a certain extent, yes, Bruce. And I'll, here's what, no, so that nobody's under the false impression that the pastor now communes openly unrepentant, whoring people. Okay, so he, he then... If she hadn't voluntarily done something, he would have no more than likely have come forward. And oh, I think he, I, no, he didn't tell me this, but my guess would be he would have told the congregation that she has been, she's confessed. I don't think he wouldn't have given the detail of the confession, but he just said, she's confessed, I've absolved her, and I welcome her to the supper, and so will you. I can hear Corby saying, and so will you, <laughs> in cowboy boots and all. And, and what would he expect? Those of you who know Corby, what would he expect the congregation to say? Amen. <laughs> now, see, it works both ways, too, Bruce, uh, with the binding and the loosing, right? Yes. In making people understand what's going on. So that we all know that the pastoral care is being done. And, it, and so that, that is a, that's what Chemnitz does. If you notice what Chemnitz does in all of his discussions about these things, one of, the, one of the things he talks about is so that people will know that there are consequences for sins before God, and secondly, there are joyful consequences for those who repent and are forgiven. You know, having a church, huge. Wouldn't the act of just letting her come to communion also make the state, same statement? Uh, it could if you know what's going on, but I mean, the point of the story that I gave was so that everybody knew for sure what had happened, that she had been absolved and was welcome. Again, so that people, I mean, seriously, think about this. If you, know what, if you know what this woman had been doing, and you know that she went to another congregation, and, if you, and then Corby just lets her back without saying anything? But she was the one that asked to have it published. That's true. That's true. So, but I think it'd be it, wise to learn from this. But I would guess his people would know him and how he operates. To most likely. Most likely. Well, the guys, yeah, most likely. But some wouldn't. Some people don't pay attention, Dan, believe it or not.